Welcome to Revelation Ancient Prophecy. This series is a detailed, in-depth study of the book of Revelation. You will discover just how relevant to our day the prophecies of Revelation really are. Here is your presenter, Pastor Baron Neustraten. Good evening, and it's wonderful to be here with you again, and uh, thank you for being here, and, and thank you for following. Um, I have had some excellent questions that, uh, that came to, uh, to our uh, email address, and uh, I'll assure you that in the next few days, those individuals, you will be, uh, I will be answering those questions, and they were very good questions, very good. I'm, I'm so pleased to see them. And uh, I, I'll remind you that the email address is Waitara Event, singular, Waitara Event at gmail.com. So please keep those questions coming, and uh, it, it'll be a privilege to answer them. And so as we open the Bible, the Word of God, could I invite you just to bow our heads and ask for His blessings. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Word. We thank you for everything that is in it because we can see your love and your goodness. And Lord, help us to understand more and more your love for us and the need to study your word. And so bless us now, open our minds and our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we continue with the book of Revelation. And as we consider that these ancient prophecies particularly the book of Revelation as well, is really proof of inspiration, and I hope to give that evidence as we continue. What I did want to say, and haven't said this far, is that the book of Revelation is really a sanctuary story. You know, the ancient Israelites, they didn't have Bibles like you and I have. Yes, they had scrolls and synagogues and etc. But, but, but if you really wanted to understand the plan of salvation, you could go to the sanctuary, the portable one in the desert, or the, the, the Solomonic or the Zerubbabel temple later on. You would go to the temple and you would learn all about the plan of salvation, which is what Revelation, in fact, the whole of the Bible, really is all about. And so uh, Jesus stands very central in, in the whole aspect of the book of Revelation because he is everything. And uh, that will become very apparent. So we started, we started with the fact that John on the island of Patmos, he, he hears the voice of Jesus, powerful. And, uh, and he, he turns around and then he sees the one that he hasn't seen for some 64 years in a celestial what shall we say, appearance. And uh, it really affects him. But he receives the strength to listen and to watch. And this is what Jesus said. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels or messengers to the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are in fact which you saw, the seven churches. Now you gar grasp this reality. Jesus is amongst the churches. He has never left any of the churches on their own, not, not then, not during the Christian era, and certainly not today. So chapter 2, where we are now, deals with the seven churches of Revelation. And these are the messengers. And when you look at the messengers to the particular places, you note the names that I have noted here. There were many, many Christian congregations, but it is about this lot that is fairly close together. I would like to say to you that when you look at Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, and, uh, or Pergamos, both terms are fine, Thyatira, Cyrus, and Philadelphia, and Laodicea, did you know that that was a postal route? Uh, I might have mentioned that last time. It's like a horseshoe shape. And we start, of course, with, with Ephesus, which was a very important, a very important place of trade and a center of religion as well. There, and they had a beautiful, very busy port at the Adriatic Sea. And so, let's start with Ephesus. To the angel, to the messenger of the church of Ephesus. Ephesus, if you had to give it an, a name, might mean desirable desirable. It represents, as we will see, the 
first century church, and the apostolic church, if you like, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand. Now that is Jesus, we just, we just mentioned that. And he says, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, who is always with his churches. I know your works, your labors, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. They hated evil, and uh, they were very patient, very persevering. And you have tested those who say they are apostles, impostors. They've always been there. And you have tested those, and that's the right way to go about it. Test them, whatever they say, test them according to Scripture. And you have tested those who say they are apostles, and they are not. If ever you want to know if someone speaks on behalf of God, go to your Bible. And you have found them, and there were imposters. You have found them liars. And you have persevered and you have patience. They are commended of their perseverance and their patience. The early church did. And have labored for my name's sake. You know, it's interesting when you look at the book of Acts, you can find that Paul, the apostle, spent time. In fact, at one time he spent three years at Ephesus. And then you had uh, uh, Priscilla and Aquila, you had uh, Apollo, you had a number of the others, tremendous uh, evangelists that spent a great deal of time in Ephesus. And Ephesus was almost like a Christian center, very important place also for Christians. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake, uh, the, the writer says. Nevertheless, notice, nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left your first love. You know, when, we, uh, when we're young, or maybe older, we fall in love. And then what happens afterwards? That's interesting. It's like that in the Christian walk. I see people, they embrace the gospel and the person of Jesus Christ. And they're all on fire. And then the fire goes out. And that's sad. The danger can be when you lose your first love. You should never lose that. You should never. In fact, your love should increase. Your love for Christ should increase. That's the message. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Remember, repent and do the first works. Do the first works or else, note this warning, I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place. In other words, you will cease to be a representation of me, is what Christ is saying unless you repent. But this you have, this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Now, who are the Nicolaitans? Well, there are some different opinions on that, but generally the consensus is that they were a certain group of Gnostics. Gnostics were people that, uh, that came up in the early first century and particularly second century who believed, who believed that the superior knowledge, a profound deep knowledge would be sufficient to get you over the line. That is what they believed. And they had all sorts of theories about how one should live. And one of them was it didn't really matter what you did in the, in the body because the body is evil. As long as you have that knowledge and that understanding, that will get you. That will get you through. Because that's contrary to Scripture. And so these people were inside the church. 
And so the Ephesian church dealt with that at the time of writing and as a representation of the first century church, the apostolic church, they were dealt with. God says, I hate them because they were antinomianism. God doesn't hate the sinner, but he hates the sin. And so the equation is God hates what they do and what they teach. He, now notice, this is said every single time to all of those churches. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, and this is another statement, which is true of all those churches, all seven, that is from beginning to end, the conditions are the same. Hear or keep, that's really the same word in Hebrew, shamar, although this comes to us in the Greek. Hear and obey the word, that's binding on everyone, and overcoming is the other. I will give to eat from the tree of life. Wonderful. Takes you back to the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve have perpetuated lives because they eat from the tree of life. Apparently, there was an ingredient that made them not age. They continued the youthful strengths, the perfect well-being and health because they ate from the tree of life. And the promise is, the promise is to God's people that Jesus makes here. He says, I will give you to eat from the tree of life. In fact, later on when we go to the later chapters of this particular magnificent book, the book of Revelation, we'll come across that. Which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Because remember, that tree was in the middle of the Garden of Eden as well. And so... Ephesus represents the apostolic church. And um, from 31 AD, when Jesus returned back to heaven, when the disciples became the apostles, uh, till roughly around about 100 AD, we have the apostolic church, which is followed by Smyrna. You remember the places that I showed you on the map. So to the messenger or the angel of the church of Smyrna. Smyrna, if you have to give it a meaning, I think most commentators agree, would, you'd say sweet smelling. Smyrna, to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write this. These things says he who is the first and the last. Now, that pertains to Jesus because he identifies and introduces himself. Like that to John. These things as the first and the last who was dead, and that was Jesus, and came to life, he rose from the dead. Now that's significant. If you, I know your works, your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. Whatever the present condition at the time of writing in Smyrna, there must have been persecutions. It's interesting that when you look at the Christian era, the first persecutions were from the Jews, who would make the life of the Christians very difficult. They used to accuse them to the authorities because they used to oppose the teachings of Christ, did not want to accept him as the Messiah, the Son of God. And so they really were very responsible to some of the persecutions that found place. But by and large, the Church of Smyrna, as you will see, really represents a church that is going through some very severe and serious persecution right throughout the Roman Empire. And uh, a lot of it is very well documented. There were at least 13 emperors who did persecute the Christians, and ten of them were very severe, and particularly the last two, and I'll come to them later on. When you were persecuted, found guilty, your property was confiscated. Common practice. And so, even though you're poor, you've lost everything materially, Jesus says, you're rich. 
You're rich in him, you see. He says, I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews. Jews. They're supposed to be pro-God, pro-God's people. But as I told you, that the actual Jews throughout the Roman Empire a number of locations would make life very difficult for the Christian and that is historically well documented. They're not really Jews in his eyes, but they are of the synagogue of Satan. Why is he saying that? Jesus is saying that because Satan is an accuser. Satan means to accuse. And that is what they used to do with the Christians, who then would be at the wrath of the authorities. <clears throat> he says, do not fear of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. So, prison sentences. That you may be tested. This is a test. Calamities so often are a test that God permits. And you will have tribulation ten days. Ten days. Many commentators have looked at 10 days. 10 is also a number of completion. You could say 10 is everything. If you say, uh, try to give a number of people present, no matter how many there are, if you say 10, you mean all the people. That's one connotation of the word 10. There is another explanation which has been given that from 303 to, 30, to 313 there was the most severest persecution of the Christians by the Diocletian and his successor Valerian. These were the worst of the worst just prior to Constantine the Great in 313 the Edict of Milan, which made the Christian religion legal. Maybe it's a reference to that. Either explanation would be fine. Be faithful unto death. The martyrdom of the Christians during the intermittent, sometimes intense and violent pagan Roman persecutions are well known. And you can read a lot of material on this. And when you, when you look what they did to them, how they slaughtered them, really, and took a, a delight in the suffering and made a, an exhibition of that, you can see the hand of Satan in those persecutions. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life, Jesus says. And here you have it again. He or she who has an ear, let him hear, her hear, what the Spirit says, the Holy Spirit says to the churches, the message of the Holy Spirit, he who overcomes shall not be heard by the second death. Now that's an interesting qualification, the second death. How can you suffer a second death if you are dead already? How can you die again? Therefore, if you die the first time, there must be a resurrection. Otherwise, you can't die a second time, can you? And so here, there is a warning. You can live, die, as before most of us, because clearly that is how it is, unless Jesus returns before we die. And that's quite possible today. So you have a life, death, and then there has to be a resurrection. And that's exactly what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that there will be a time that everybody will be brought back to life. And that for the lost, those who didn't make it, those who are not saved, that there will be a second death, a second death of which there is no resurrection. And we will talk about that, particularly when we come to the last chapters of the book of Revelation. It is crystal clear. God gives us all the information that we require and need. So the second death will have no impact on those who overcome. And that's it. Smyrna, 
represents the persecuted church, the persecuted church from around 100 AD to 313 AD. I already mentioned to you that 313 AD was the year that Constantine the Great in the Edict of Milan made the Christian religion legal. And that caused a big change. And that brings us to the church of Pergamos. Now Pergamos or Pergamum is pretty well synonymous to the angel, the messenger of the church of Pergamos. Write this, write this, note the message. These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. Now you remember when John turned around, he saw uh, out of the mouth of Christ, this is symbolism, like a two-edged sword coming out of the mouth of Christ. That means what comes out of your mouth are the words and the teachings. The two sharp, two-edged sharp sword represents the precise teachings of Jesus, which is the truth. Because he only taught truth, of course. So the one who taught the truth. I know you works where you dwell. Have a look at this language. Have a look at this language. Where Satan's throne is. Satan's throne. Why would you qualify Pergamos as Satan's throne? Historically, it is fascinating. When the Chaldean, the Babylonians were defeated by the Medo-Persian armies of under Cyrus, as you know, they lost their st the Chaldean, the, the ones who were the diviners and the the learned, the wise, the, the ones, the astrologers, the ones who claimed communication with the dead. And all their pagan beliefs fell in disrepute under the Persians who didn't want to know anything of them because they were adherents by and large to Zoroastrianism. Now these Chaldeans, actually quite a few of them, went to this place, Pergamon, which is interesting where they proclaimed and, and preached or taught or, or practiced their occult beliefs. And it really found roots. It's also in Pergamum where the first emperor worship, that is Augustus Caesar, who took the title Pontifus Maximus. He was the first Roman emperor to do that, Pontifus Maximus. He called themselves. There are others who say that Julius Caesar did the same. But the interesting thing is that Augustus, Augustus adapted, uh, accepted uh, uh, the worship of deity for himself. There were many, many, many temples dedicated to paganism in Pergamum, more than anywhere else. You could say it was the absolute center of pagan worship and the occult. And, and remember the title. The title that Augustus Caesar adopted, Pontifus Maximus, later on was transferred to the Bishop of Rome. You might like to remember that. Where Satan's throne is, this is an apt description of that era that we're dealing with now. And you hold fast to my name, he says. You hold fast to my name and you did not deny my faith. There were faithful ones. Those who remained faithful, even though, and this is the fascinating thing. The church became legal. It became very legal to be a Christian. In fact, after the Edict of Milan, within about six years, it was fashionable to become a Christian. Would you believe that? It became fashionable. Even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr. How am I to read this? Do we know an historical figure of Antipas? No, there is no such person. Some people have said maybe it was Polycarp who was executed in 156 AD. If you look at the name, it's a composite word. Anti means in place of. Pass is the abbreviated form of pater. So instead of the father, in the place of the father, the representatives of the father, if you like, God's people, God's witnesses were martyred. And that was true. Who was killed amongst you. 
where Satan, there you have it again, dwells. And I've just explained to you the reasons why you could call Pergamum to be Satan's throne, seat. It's interesting that Pergamos, the last king of its independence, uh, did actually in the, at 133 BC, he did surrender, bequeath his kingdom, and his name was Attalus III, he bequeathed his kingdom to Rome, pagan Rome. Isn't that interesting? That's what he did. But I have a few things against you. A few things against you. Because you have here those who have hold the doctrine of Balaam. Now, I don't know if you remember who Balaam was. Well, you find him in the book of Numbers. When the children of Israel were approaching the promised land, Balaam was employed by a Moabite king to be cursed. You find this story in Numbers. Now, the interesting thing is, Balaam wanted to curse the people of God, but he couldn't. He could only bless them because God took control of him. Isn't that interesting? But after that, after that, Balaam suggested to Balak, the king of the Moabites, he said, I can't curse him because God won't let me. But if you want to be successful in defeating these people, you have to split them up from God, their God. You've got to get them to go against the will of God. Bring on the girls, the good-looking ones, the easy-going ones. And have a party, have a feast. And that's what Balak did. Do you know he was extremely successful? Thousands of the Jews, the Israelites, were actually executed because of their participation in that sin, and some of them so knowingly and openly. It's a great story as an object lesson that you could find in the book of Numbers. Balak, the enemy of Balaam, the enemy of God's people, a false prophet, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block. <laughs> I just told you before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols. No doubt that is what they were doing there and then. But you are what you eat. And so we have in the story of Pergamos or Pergamum, we have the story of taking in all the falseness and uh, the licentiousness that was prevailing at the time when Balaam advised Bala to do what he did. Not to commit sexual immorality. This is in a spiritual sense. It was in a literal sense at the time when they were just before, they're at Baal Peor, just before the promised land. Sexual immorality in a spiritual sense is to connect yourself with entities you should not connect yourself with. And the most common, the most common is when religion and state get together. Our history has been plagued by that practice. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Now I spoke to you on the Nicolaitans. These were Gnostics, a group of Gnostics, who believed you could live the way you wanted to live as long as you had the deeper knowledge, as long as you had that profound knowledge, you would get be saved. The thing that I hate, God says again, and he says, repent or else I will come to you quickly. I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. That is, with the words that I have spoken. Now you remember maybe a statement that Jesus made. He said, he said, I haven't come to judge, but the words that I speak to you, they will judge you. That's what he said. And there you have the two-edged sharp sword explanation that comes from his mouth. He who has an ear, there you have it again, let him hear, and that means to keep what the Spirit, the Holy Spirit says to the churches, to him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. Now that's an interesting statement. 
it is reported that some of pots of manna were put inside the ark, so it's hidden. Others say, no, it was put in front of the ark. There's different opinion of that in the most holy place, where only the high priest could come once a year, whichever way hidden. But the manna from God, of course, is sustenance into eternal life. And I will give him a white stone. Why the white stone? A white stone was often used in judicial uh, decisions, whether you be innocent or guilty. And there was a reliance upon God to direct the white stone amongst the dark stones. And if you got the white stone, you were innocent, pronounced innocent, blameless, in fact. On the stone, a new name. A name, another word, is character. A new character. A new character. And no one knows except him that receives it. Now, this makes sense. That God gives you a disposition, a new mind, being born again, if you like, a new character that can only come from him. And only you can know it. Others may see it, but you personally know it by experience. Pergamum represents the church from 312 or 313 AD to 538 AD. And the reason, the reason why I use 538 AD, and many commentators do, is because that is the day, that is the year, that the last opponents of the Bishop of Rome, the Ostrogoths, were actually defeated by the Justinian armies from the Eastern or Byzantine Roman Empire. And so that's a very significant date. At that date, when, when they were set free from the Ostrogoth, the Bishop of Rome could exert his power and his power grew and grew and grew exponentially and politically. He became a very powerful being through entities through the Dark Ages, which is, by the way, well, well documented. And so that is Pergamos, that is Pergamos. To the angel of the churches in Thyatira. Thyatira was a center of trade. There were many uh, guilds, uh, organizations of the various trades. In fact, the, the book of Acts reports on a woman by the name of Lydia. She was a selling of, of purple. Uh, that was one of the, the trades that they had in Thyatira. But Thyatira was a corrupt church. So after 538, when the Bishop of Rome becomes that powerful entity invested with certain civil right propositions uh, where it could control and was meant to control the whole Christian church wherever it was, Justinian in 533 BC had designated the Bishop of Rome to be, to be the persecutor of all heretics. Anybody thinking differently than the Bishop of Rome was a heretic. And so, and so, what happened here? The angel of the church of Thyatira write this, these things, says the Son of God, here's a clear identification, who has the eyes like a flame of fire. Again, I, I point to you the Description that John gives when he sees Jesus again. And his feet like fine brass. So we know who's speaking here. I know your works. This is about the people during the early papal era and the later one. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. He says, I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, he says, the last are more than the first. It means as we go into the papal era, there has to be a strong opposition which was, which was finding place, the Reformation that came into being. And we'll talk more about the Reformation when we talk about the Church of Sardis, because that is really the Church of the era of the Reformation. Now, here we have the description that it would intensify. And that is what it did do. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, he says, because you allow that woman Jezebel. Now, Jezebel, you should remember. Jezebel was married to King Ahab. King Ahab gave in 
to Jezebel, who was the daughter of a pagan priest, Phoenician pagan priest. She introduced sun worship. She introduced false prophets, 400 of them. False priests, hundreds of them. She married to Ahab was a combination of an apostate church, which is represented so clearly by Jezebel, an apostate church and the state were married together. An unholy alliance, if you like. Here is the forerunner of the eschatological reality that the state and the church will work together to dominate your thinking, your religious belief and faith and practice. And there's a tremendous warning here. Jezebel was that kind of a person. And by the way, she persecuted. You go to the story of Elijah, you know the story that, that uh, one of the, the good men by the name of Abadiah said to, said, said to the prophet that the good prophets were killed by Jezebel because she hated them. She wanted Baal, Baal, the sun worship to be observed. And that should ring a bell in the mind if you have any knowledge at all about the, some of the prophecies that will be coming our way in the last chapters of the book of Revelation. Very apt description, who calls herself a prophetess, meaning the mouthpiece for God. That's what the church claimed, but it wasn't. To teach and secure my servants to commit sexual immorality, that is an illicit relationship, and the most common one during that era was state and church. To eat things sacrificed to idols, that is, to take in all the errors that flooded through the front into the church. I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality. She did not repent. And note this, indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed and those who commit adultery with her in great tribulation. My death refer to some of the pandemics that have plagued the Middle Ages in an incredible proportion, perhaps exceeding the one that we are suffering right now. It could be. And so, unless they repent of their deeds, she didn't change her mind. I will kill her children with death. A pestilence would be a better description. I will kill her children with pestilence. It means there is an offspring. This institution of Tyre Tyra, which does represent the medieval church that dominates, will have its offsprings who will accept her teachings and her dealings and her beliefs. And all the churches shall know, I like this, that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you I say, and to the rest in Tyre, as many as do not have this doctrine, have not yielded to this doctrine that was so prevalent during the Middle Ages, when all the errors of scriptures, the paganism came in through the front door into the church, and I could give you a whole list and have not known the depths of Satan, that is, the so-called deep knowledge, knowing better, as they say, I will put on you no further burden, but hold fast to what you have, that is, the truth that you have, until I come, and he who overcomes, here you have it again, and keeps my works until the end, to him, to her, I will give power over the nations, he or she shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like a potter's vessel, which is really from Psalms. It's a messianic uh, status that we're talking about. As I have also have received from my father, and I will give them the morning star. And that is, of course, a reference to Jesus. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Thyatira is the church that you might put from 538 to 1517. Why 1517? Well, 1517 was when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses 
onto the door there of Württemberg. And that gave the, the impetus to the Reformation uh, in such a, such a way that ultimately it could compete with the power that so had dominated the then known world. The Reformation uh, saved so many people and reintroduced the Bible, of course, and the, the struggle wasn't over after 1517. There were many more years to come of struggle, but 1517 truly was a tremendous turning point. So my concluding comment here, because I have to let go of you, I just want to note this. Persecutions. Uh, this is just a little sketch here. You can read some of the names of the countries where persecutions find place. You know, we are so privileged in this country. We can practice, say, live what we believe. But in many countries of the world, even today, that is not true. There's another thing that sometimes bothers me. We forget all the martyrs, the suffering that they gave their lives, the manner in which they gave it, the manner in which they were killed, the brutality, the incredible cruelty satanically induced against the people of God. Should be sufficient, should be sufficient evidence to know that there is a devil, there is a Satan who hates all the teachings of Christ. And so he hates Christians and that, <laughs> that, that would be you. And so, there is one name, the name on the, if whenever you have time, you should try to read that. I read recently about a country like Iran. You know, have I asked you, where is the fastest growing number of Christians? You would never say Iran, but it actually is. Persecuted, losing all their rights when found out of being Christian. That's where it's growing. Throughout the era of the Christian churches, the martyrdom has been really the seed of the church. It has grown. Remember, Christ was always walking amongst his churches. He was with his people. He was always there. Never indifferent. Never took his eyes of his people as they suffered. And it's good to remember that. So, Revelation, next week, uh, we will certainly look at the messages to some of the other churches. Uh, the three left, and uh, the three that are left, of course, uh, already alluded to Sardis. That is really the Church of the Reformation to 1798, and I will explain why I use that date next week. Philadelphia, brotherly love. The church from 1798 to 1844 and then the one that we should really study because that is since 1844. That is the church that is actually us. A people being judged. So may God bless you as you contemplate what you might have learned today. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we... Uh, had the opportunity again to study your word. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the evidence that we can find from your word that you will always be and always have been with your people, your church. No matter what she goes through, you are there right in the middle. You give us the message, the right message. And we thank you for your presence here tonight that you open our minds and our hearts. Bless us now, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You've been listening to Revelation Ancient Prophecy with Pastor Baron Neustraten, brought to you by 3ABN Australia Radio. For more information on this series, visit waitarachurch.org.au.
God of Heaven by Ben Everson. Up next, Acapel Dridge will sing On Zion's Glorious Summit. On Zion's glorious summit stood a numerous host redeemed by blood. They him their king in strains divine. I heard the song and strove to song and strove to join. Here all who suffered sword or flame for truth or Jesus' lovely name shall victory now and hail the Lamb and bow before the great High. While 
everlasting ages roll, eternal love shall feast their soul, and seeds of bliss forever new, rising sun station to their view, rising succession to Lewis once said, there are far, far better things ahead than any we leave behind. That's absolutely true. After death, the resurrection and eternal life, mansions in heaven and streets of gold. But in order to experience that, there needs to be another death. The Bible speaks of coming to faith in Jesus and dying to sin, dying to the old life, dying to self. When you accept Jesus, the person you were dies and you are reborn to live a new life. Paul wrote in Romans 6 verse 7, He that is dead is freed from sin. And that's one of the great joys of the Christian life. Sin doesn't have to govern your life. Temptation doesn't have to own you. When you die to sin, and when you're alive in Jesus, sin doesn't control you. God's Spirit guides you. Freedom is good. When the old you dies, you are free from sin. I'm John Bradshaw for It Is Written. Let's live today by every word. Hello, folks. Lovely to be with you again today. William Macklin speaking. Today, I would like to talk to you about rivers. Like a liquid serpent, the river snakes its way following the path of least resistance until finally it empties its watery burden into the surging sea. Rivers turn a crispy, dry landscape into lush pastures for animals to quietly grace and enjoy the blessings water brings. Rivers, by their very nature, move water from its trickling or oozing source across hundreds or thousands of miles of countryside to eventually mix its fresh water with the salty ocean. Other small waterways, be they creeks, brooks or streams, do something similar but for shorter distances than their mighty big brother, the river. Creeks may merely run over a farmer's land into a dam he has made. The Bubbling Brook, a slightly bigger sibling, features in more poems than any other watercourse. And streams are nearly rivers but are not quite there yet. Creeks, brooks and streams usually empty into a river or lake, whereas only rivers' vast source of water dares to empty their load of H2O into farther ocean or sea. Without water, of course, rivers and those smaller watercourses I have mentioned are only ruts in the landscape. Not much good for anything, really. Some rivers in drier countries and continents are always empty and dry in the summer or extended drought periods, but then fill with raging water when the rains come. The Fink River, or as we say these days, Larapinta, in central Australia, is an example of such a river. Most rivers never stop flowing and the mightiest of all, the Amazon, in northern South America, 
carries such a vast quantity of water into the Atlantic Ocean, its water is still fresh 200 miles out to sea. Roe River in Montana, USA, is the world's shortest river, running for a distance of only 201 feet, or 61 metres. Now that's a short river. The world's three longest rivers are all over 6,000 kilometres. The Amazon is 6,992 kilometres. The Nile is 6,853 kilometres. And the Yangtze is 6,300 kilometres in length. Of these, the Amazon is not dammed due to the surrounding terrain, but the Nile and the Yangtze are, providing huge amounts of water for domestic consumption and industrial use. One of the attractive features of rivers is the vegetation, large and small, that flourishes besides its banks. The river gums, beside Australia's Murray, are full of character and have, in fact, been the subject of many landscape paintings over the years. Many giant trees do not grow beside rivers, though, but still require a good rainfall to promote their growth. For example, in southwest Western Australia, southern Victoria and in the prime treed areas of Tasmania. Humans use rivers for water storage, for transport, recreation, irrigation, industrial and commercial use and for other purposes I'm sure you can call to mind. Many of the rivers have those special boats known as paddle steamers seen on their waters that in the past were prime means of travel up and down the Mississippi and the Murray to name just two. Nowadays, though, these never-say-die vessels usually carry holidaymakers or day-trippers, anxious to enjoy a day or a week or two on the water. There is just something about water in its many forms that appeals to people. The Bible refers to rivers quite a deal, including in the very last chapter, Revelation 22, where in verse 1 it states, Then the angel showed me the river of life, as clear as crystal, for it contained nothing impure. It flowed from the throne of God and the throne of the Lamb. We cannot imagine a world without rivers, even though some make jokes about them, to wit, Sydney ciders when referring to Melbourne's Yarra, flowing upside down, they say. The fact is, we cannot do without water. And when rivers do the convenient thing and bring water to us, then who are we to deny their service? You've been listening to a production of 3ABN Australia Radio.